All right, I want to start with the initials GBI because people know what the FBI is and they know lots of three letter initials uh, being government agencies that do investigations, but what is the GBI and why should anyone care? The Georgia Bureau of Investigation is a statewide investigative agency, a law, a law enforcement agency. It's basically the equivalent of the FBI, but at the state level. Uh, so uh, the GBI typically conducts investigations uh, that, um, you know, maybe are uh, have have uh, elements of it that go beyond just the county level, right? Uh, so it, it it typically will conduct you know some of the more complex investigations in the state of Georgia. Um, it is kind of the investigative arm of the attorney general's office within the state of Georgia. Our attorney general is Chris Carr, who is a Republican. Uh, Attorney General, and uh, yeah, so that's the that's what the GBI stands for. In terms of why should anyone care? Do you mean why should anyone care about this specific investigation? Well, or... so yeah, normally we do. Uh, we don't sort of do a whole lot with state police agencies um, uh, at Lawfare. Uh, how did the GBI get wrapped up in something that lawfare uh, would care about? Right. So it, it, it takes a little bit of backstory, a little bit of explaining, but I'm going to try to uh, keep it short and give you just the short version of it. Uh, there was a voting systems breach in Coffee County, Georgia, that folks might be familiar with because it has appeared in the Fulton County indictment in Fulton County, Georgia, brought by District Attorney Fonnie Willis. It is a part of that sprawling RICO indictment. It's one of the alleged kind of aspects or prongs of, of that conspiracy. Uh, it it uh, is something that occurred in January of 2021, the day after the attack on the Capitol. Uh, it, it involved local officials, Kathy Latham, Misty Hampton, a bail bondsman named Scott Hall. All of those folks were indicted in Fulton County in August. Uh, and then, of course, it, it was alleged that, that Sidney Powell paid for that work through her Defending the Republic charity. Uh, there were also additional breaches that occurred throughout the month of January 2021, uh, and, and this breach kind of was uncovered uh, over the course of, of a year or two in civil litigation in this election security case called Curling versus Raffensperger, which is an ongoing case over uh, the security of, of uh, voting systems in the state of Georgia. Uh, and when it came to light in February of 2022, um, you know, it's something that the Secretary of State's office seemed to drag its feet on a little bit in terms of uh, investigating, but eventually, you know, enough ev evidence came to light that they were prompted to ask the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to get involved in August of 2022, some, you know, six months after it first came to, to light publicly in February of 2022. Uh, and, and then following the involvement of the GBI, at the same time, we had this parallel investigation that was going on with a special grand jury in Fulton County, which was uh, brought by Fawny Willis. And as the civil litigation started learning more uh, facts about what had occurred in, in Coffee County, and it, and it seemed to be that you know, it, there were people who were maybe involved in this alleged RICO conspiracy who were also involved in Fulton County. Uh, it's at that point that Fonnie Willis became interested in it. They started subpoenaing people to come before the special grand jury. So they carried out this separate investigation. And, and then, of course, though, the GBI had this other parallel investigation. And I think the reason why it matters is is, you know, there's been this alleged crime in, in Fulton County, Georgia, about a conspiracy that involved uh, the president's legal team and, and local officials who were loyal to the then president. 
uh, and and they conspired allegedly to unlawfully access voting systems data in the state of Georgia and then distribute that data. Uh, and and so there's this question of well, you know, did the GBI investigate it fully? And that matters because the Fulton County indictment has always been somewhat jurisdictionally limited and then also limited in terms of the resources that a county district attorney has to, to investigate uh, you know, the full extent or the full scope of, of what occurred in Coffee County. So does that sum it up, Ben? Yes, very well. Um, uh, all right. So you recently acquired a copy of the full of the GBI report itself, uh, and we published it on Lawfare. Some other reporters uh, wrote about it uh, as well. Uh, what can you tell us about what the GBI did and what the report is? Right. So. The GBI investigated for approximately 13 months, though I will say that Attorney General Chris Carr has said that his office has received the report, but they continue to coordinate with the GBI. So there's some question about whether maybe there's ongoing investigative work that's going on. I uh, am not uh, apprised of those details because they are not public and, and the Attorney General's office, you know, has has uh, not commented a whole lot publicly about, about what's going on or a timeline or, or uh, kind of some of the details about its investigative strategy at this point. Uh, but they wrapped up their investigation shortly after the Fulton County District Attorney in August brought that sprawling RICO indictment that included the Coffee County prong of, of the conspiracy. Uh, it's a 392 page report over those 13 months, uh, a very small, you know, maybe three or four person investigative team uh, interviewed approximately 15 witnesses, although it kind of depends on how how you count what an, what an interview is, because there were some meetings, briefing meetings that they had with, for example, the Secretary of State's office, who, it, it, you know, when I was counting these witnesses, I didn't really include that because that's more of a uh, a briefing rather than, you know, a, a witness interview. Uh, but regardless, they interviewed about 15 witnesses. Most of those witnesses were people who were uh, Coffee County level uh, individuals, as opposed to, uh, you know, folks who might be connected more towards the uh, Trump campaign's post-election efforts. Um, and, and, and they produced this report that is largely based on review of documents and dep dep depositions from the Curling versus Raffensperger case, which is the civil litigation that I mentioned, where this started coming to light. The reason for that being that there's, there's a question about how the Coffee County breach could have implications for the security of elections in Georgia, uh, it, it, you know, the Secretary of State's office has 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 kind of minimized that that argument. But the plaintiffs in that case who are trying to get Georgia to to switch to uh, uh, base hand marked ballots and, and want to move away from Dominion machines, uh, they have argued, you know, that this uh, reflects on the 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 so the so called dangers of of using the Dominion voting systems in Georgia, although they have very different arguments from, you know, the arguments that people have raised in in the context of the the 2020 election and that kind of stuff. So so they reviewed this evidence from the Crowling versus Raffensper Raffensperger case. They also reviewed a very small number of depositions from the January 6th committee. That was Giuliani's deposition and Sidney Powell's deposition, as well as the January 6th committee's final report. Uh, and then they did have, you know, a few things that they did that were unique or independent to the GBI's investigation. Uh, they, uh, after, you know, almost a year of investigating, they ultimately obtained a search warrant to get the contents of 
Misty Hampton's computer in the Coffee County Elections Office. Misty Hampton, of course, is the former election supervisor who is one of the people who allegedly uh, allowed this uh, copying and, and distribution of the elections data to occur in the month of January 2021. Uh, and, and there was some question about whether the entire board potentially ha had authorized the work, whether Misty Hampton authorized the work. There were these uh, kind of, you know, vague references to this writ so-called written invitation uh, uh, to come in and copy the data that uh, that Sullivan Strickler, the forensic firm, did copy. Uh, and, and so the GBI was able to obtain that so-called written invitation, which uh, maybe we can talk about a little bit more at some point, uh, Ben, but uh, suffice to say, I've written previously that that written invitation is not actually, in, in fact, a written invitation. So that's a, I think that summarizes what the GBI did in those 13 months. Okay. So it is fair to say that you are, uh, you have some reservations about this report um, uh, as a piece of work product. Um, so at the highest level of altitude, we're going to go into all the details, but at the, at a high level of altitude, what's the problem from your point of view? Well, I think the problem is that over the of uh, over a more than year long investigation, the GPI failed to investigate key witnesses, uh, and they also omitted details that I, I think are really uh, relevant to some of the investigative questions that they left unanswered. So, you know, the, the first and foremost is. How exactly did uh, several local officials in a rural county in South Georgia get connected to the then president's legal team? That is a question that is 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 something that really no one has has quite been able to precisely answer. Um, and and through that civil litigation in, in the Curling versus Raffensperger case, of course, they're limited in terms of, you know, what civil litigants can can do or what questions they're asking. They have their own, uh, you know, agenda, their own uh, kind of things that they're doing in depositions in that case that is very different from what maybe a, a criminal law enforcement agency would be doing. Uh, and so I kind of expected that maybe, you know, the, the GBI would be answering some of those questions that are, are relevant to this question of who was involved in this, in this conspiracy, when did it first, uh, when did the plan first arise, and how did any of these uh, alleged conspirators sort of all come together and how were they connected? Uh, and, and the GBI seems to have been... Uh, quite potentially uninterested in, in answering those questions because, as I said, it it, it didn't try to uh, you know uh, seek interviews with with many key witnesses, and it mainly just kind of uh, uh, looked at the civil litigation documents and the January sixth committee report. Um, rather than doing its own investigative work to get to the bottom of some of these some of these questions. All right, we're going to dive deep into those deficiencies in a moment, but let's start by giving uh, the devil or the GBI its due. And uh, you did note one area where it made a real contribution, which is that it uh, seems to have answered the question of what the story behind the written invitation is. So let's uh, let's start there. And uh, uh, why does the written invitation matter? And what, in fact, happened? Right. So the written invitation mattered to some extent. Uh, if people might recall that when Sidney Powell was indicted and still before she pleaded guilt, she's now pleaded guilty to uh, some charges related to the Coffee County breach, but when she was, uh, you know, litigating her case pr pr 
prior to that plea agreement, uh, she was making arguments that the uh, that the copying and distribution that occurred in January 2021, which she had paid for, was authorized by the County Board of Elections, or or at least that it was um, under the color of authorization through uh, the election supervisor, who who is not a member of the board of elections there, but who is a kind of administrative person, a, a clerk of sorts. Uh, she made this argument that, you know, they believe they had lawful authorization uh, because there was this written invitation. In the Curling versus Raffensperger case, there were also these references that came out through text messages that were produced uh, by the forensics company Sullivan Strickler. There was a woman named Catherine Fries, who is a attorney who worked very closely with Rudy Giuliani during the post-election efforts in, in 2020 for the Trump campaign. She, uh, you know, had sent this, this text message to a Sullivan Strickler employee in which she said, yay, we have access to Coffee County systems and, and we received it by written invitation, you know, exclamation point, exclamation point. Uh, and, and so it, there was this question of, you know, what did this written invitation say? Could it potentially uh, be something that exonerated to some extent any of these people insofar as maybe they thought they had uh, authorization from the county board of elections or, or some kind of local official. Uh, so what the GBI did is, again, uh, as I mentioned, they, they got a search warrant. They recovered the documents on Misty Hampton's uh, uh, email from the, uh, from the elections office. The written invitation, as it turns out, is something that was written in response to an open records request or a purported open records request from an, an attorney named Preston Halliburton. Uh, remember that name because we, we will probably talk about him in a little bit. Uh, he is an attorney who is, is a Georgia-based attorney uh, who represented Giuliani in, at some of these state legislative hearings that occurred during the month of December of 2020, when uh, Giuliani was going before state, legislat state legislators in Georgia trying to convince them that there was reason to call a special session to overturn the results of the election based on allegations of, of voter fraud that were, of course, not, uh, not true. Um, so Misty Hampton responds to this so-called open records request from Preston Halliburton, uh, and, and I have a, I wrote a lawfare article about it kind of explaining in more detail as to why it's, it's not something that could be construed as authorizing what actually took place in terms of the copying of, of virtually every component of the voting system in Coffee County's elections office. But what she said, in effect, was, y'all are welcome to come to our office anytime, uh, and we can help you in any way in accordance with Georgia law. Of course, the, the relevant statutes and, and elections code does not just allow an election supervisor to invite in, you know, third parties. To uh, steal their software. To, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so that's kind of, uh, I think that explains... <laughs> what the 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 key kind of uh, contribution of the gbi's investigation was was get it, recovering that document all right so let's uh the body of your article is about the things that the gbi didn't do and about how much stuff there is in the public record or not quite in the public record but nothing a little Facebook stalking wouldn't reveal or nothing that picking up the phone and calling somebody, you know, the, the most consensual of consensual interviews wouldn't reveal. So without repeating the entire article, because it's, you know, 6,500 words long, what are, what are the big things that the GBI does not appear to have even investigated. It seems like there are sort of three or four of them. Give us an overview of what they, and I'll break in and, and 
uh, uh, and kind of ask for more on some of them. But what are the, what are the big areas where they just seem to have dropped the ball? Right. So I would say one big area is kind of the events leading up to the breach on January 7th, 2021, and then throughout the month of January as well. So it starts with this engagement agreement that Sidney Powell made with Sullivan Strickler, the forensics firm in, I want to say it's November of 2020 after the election. Uh, that was for work in Michigan and Arizona. Uh, and then it just skips ahead to uh, New Year's Eve when Preston Halliburton, the attorney that I mentioned, is sending this so-called open records request and, and Misty Hampton is, you know, responding with the purported writ invitation. But it doesn't really give you any sense of how did any of these people, a bail bondsman from Georgia, the uh, the president's attorneys, um, you know, a local GOP official, how did any of these people, you know, how were they connected? What were some of the uh, events that led up to the breach that might be relevant? Um, and, and I think that the thing, the kind of sequence of events that I pinpointed in the piece is this trip that Kathy Latham, who is the then Coffee County GOP chair, who would uh, on January 7th escort the forensics team into the elections office. Uh, we, there are videos showing that. Uh, she you know, made this trip from uh, approximately December 16th to December 18th, 2020, um, which is right around the same time that the Trump team was kind of, you know, at a very critical time. They were on the hunt for access to voting machines. There is that uh, so-called unhinged White House meeting that occurs. And based on the January 6th uh, committee depositions, we know that there was one plan that came from folks like Sidney Powell and Michael Flynn, uh, who wanted to who wanted Trump to sign an, an executive order, which would allow the federal government to seize state voting machines. Uh, and then on the other hand, there are these references from Powell and from Derek Lyons uh, that suggest that Rudy Giuliani proposed a different plan, which was voluntary access to voting machines in Georgia. Uh, and you know, I, again, I don't want to get too in the weeds with it, but what what I found uh, is is that it's it apparently seems to be the case that when Kathy Latham was in D.C. at that time, the night before that December 18th meeting, when these things are being discussed, she had a meeting with Rudy Giuliani. Uh, and, and that seems like, and I'm not making any kind of, you know, claims or assumptions about what occurred during that meeting, but, uh, you know, those are the kinds of investigative leads or, or relevant facts that would at least seem worthy of, of, uh, investigating from, a, from a law enforcement perspective, um, considering that these are people who, you know, in Fulton County, it's been alleged we're a part of a uh, overarching conspiracy to overturn the results of the election that Coffee County was a part of that. Right. Um, so you, the, the, the broad point is that from reading the GBI report, you would think that the conspiracy starts with the retention of Sullivan Strickler in November and then skips to the right around the new year and left out is this whole saga that you kind of unfold about how Kathy Latham came to be in Washington and meeting with the very people, as it turns out, who then uh, who are then presenting to the president the idea of a consensual seizure of state voting equipment in Georgia. And all of this is available uh, without subpoenas, without, I mean, you didn't have subpoena power. What were you, where were you getting this information? No, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I wrote a previous piece on some of these details uh, in which I looked at the January 6th committee depositions, but 
in this new piece that I've written, the reporting is based on, you know, voluntary interviews. I just called up a, a, an attorney in Georgia who uh, attended this, you know, tour group that Kathy Latham originally uh, is the reason purportedly why she went to DC at that time. Uh, and, and I talked to him, uh, you know, he said that he knew that, that Kathy Latham at that time, um, or he learned after they got back from their trip that Kathy Latham had been meeting with, uh, Sidney Powell while, while they were in DC. Um, you know, he described her behavior as, um, she disappeared a lot. He thought it was very odd in retrospect. Um, uh, he did not, uh, hear, ever hear anything about her meeting with Giuliani, but, um, just based on social media posts that I was able to find um, and, and piece together some of the timeline of this based on the dates that she was in D.C., uh, you know, she herself said in, in, a, in a Facebook comment that, that we um, unearthed that she had met with uh, Mayor, had a, or quote, had a meeting with Mayor Giuliani in December of 2020 and, and while she, she was on this trip. And she wasn't just in the same city. She was staying in the Willard Hotel. She was uh, where Giuliani was helping run the famous war room. She right. was, she definitely, there are pictures of her with, uh, I mean, they clearly crossed paths. And then she shows up in Georgia uh, um, you know, and then he goes off and says, starts saying, well, we can get this stuff consensually. Um, you know, it's, it is highly suggestive, uh, and circumstantial evidence that they, that this trip is a pivotal thing where this idea gets cooked up. All right. So that's basket number one. Kathy Latham goes to Washington, uh, where she got to see the Christmas trees and the, Chris, the, the National Christmas Tree and got to visit the Bible Museum and got to meet with Rudy Giuliani. Um, uh, uh, what is basket number two? Well, basket number two is this, uh, this legislative hearing that occurs in Georgia in, on December 30th of 2020. So uh, maybe like 10 days, uh, 12 days after Kathy Latham is in DC where she crosses paths with Powell and Giuliani and Flynn and all these people. And there's all these discussions. And this is a public legislative hearing, right? Like right. you don't need any to do any sleuthing or you don't need to subpoena anybody it was like pretty clear what was going on. Right. It's pretty clear what was going on. You can literally watch it on YouTube. They have the whole hearing. Uh, you know, I, I watched it on a Facebook live from one of the participants, but the reason that this hearing is important, Ben, is because it has Rudy Giuliani, who is there in person in Georgia, talking about getting access to voting machines in Georgia before the state legislatures. Uh, you have Kathy Latham, who is there claiming whistleblower status, talking about problems in Coffee County, Georgia, and she is represented by Preston Halliburton, who is the attorney who is also representing Giuliani at the same hearing. Uh, and, and of course, Preston Halliburton is the guy who the very next day makes the open records request that initiates the kind of thing that starts all of this. Uh, and then also there you have Jovan Pulitzer, who is this former treasure hunter who claims to be an expert at detecting fraudulent ballots. Uh, and, there had and, to be a former treasure hunter. In of course. Story. I mean, we've already, there's another guy who's a former pro surfer. I mean, it's, uh, it, a lot of uh, interesting characters here, uh, but uh, uh, so then, and then you also have, am I missing someone? Giuliani, Hall Halliburton, Kathy Latham, uh, uh, Pulitzer. So you have all those people in the same room. I mean, at the same time, it's also very interesting because there's a few other people who are there who are now indicted, indicted in Fulton County uh, in terms of the, the broader RICO scheme. 
But you've got those four individuals in the same room at the same time talking about voting machines. Uh, and then the very next day, that's when Preston Halliburton initiates the written invitation. And then the day after that, Catherine Fries writes the text message to the Sullivan Strickler employees in which she says, we got a written invitation. I just landed back in DC with the mayor and I'm putting details together with Phil Waldron, Jovan Pulitzer, uh, Preston Halliburton. So at least two of those people that she's putting details together with had literally been in the same room with Giuliani and Latham two days before. So it, it seems like that's relevant in terms of, you know, uh, figuring out how did this plan come about or or when did it come about? Uh, those are the kinds of and things. And what was the scope of it? Right. Mm -hmm. So so how much about this hearing and this gathering that associates that is associated with the hearing appears in the GBI report? It doesn't appear at all. Uh, and I mean, there are details too that I, I didn't, I wasn't able to include in the piece, um, uh, but, it, and, and so maybe that's for uh, an, another time, but it's, you know, there's, there's interesting connections insofar, you know, Jovan Pulitzer says that after that hearing, he, he on social, media post, he says that he stayed in Georgia. Uh, and there are photos in which he's with Patrick Byrne, who Patrick Byrne says in his book that he flew to Georgia on uh, New Year's Eve uh, after a call from Scott Hall, who, you know, is the bail bondsman who, who ultimately, uh, you know, flew down to Coffee County on January 7th. So there's all these kind of other details as well that just are easily discussed. Uh, but but it seems like, you know, the GBI, they just didn't include anything about the legislative hearing, which surely they knew about it. So it's very odd. All right. So what is basket number three? Basket number three involves a jet and uh, and the my pillow guy. Um, right. <laughs> like, how did he get involved in this? Well, I have no idea because. It, it it's a it's something again that kind of goes uh, a question that that is that is left unanswered. Uh, but in terms of what the GBI does say about Mike Lindell, who of course is the CEO and founder of of My Pillow, which is the you know pillow uh, company that is that is on Fox News the a lot and Empire. The Pillow Empire, I should say. Uh, he's on Fox News a lot. He has his own, I think it's called Frank TV, which is kind of a, a, a TV or a online network that's basically devoted to them talking about uh, election um, uh, fraud stuff. And uh, so he he is this guy who, you know, is known to be an election conspiracy theorist. He, he got involved at some point uh, in the post-election period uh, with some Trump uh, campaign activities and funding different kind of efforts to get access to elections data. Uh, and there's this really just odd kind of subplot in which Mike Lindell's private jet on the very night that Misty Hampton, the election supervisor, resigns you know, she purportedly resigned for uh, falsifying her timesheets, but, uh, you know, she resigns. And then the very night that she resigns in February of 2021, Mike Lindell's private jet, uh, according to the GBI report, makes a, a sudden kind of stop as it flies from D.C. to Texas to the municipal airport in Douglas, Georgia. <laughs> Uh, it is so I there. gotta say, I don't find that strange at all. When when I am flying from you know Texas to Florida, I often stop in Coffee County on the spur of the moment to meet with pillow entrepreneurs. Uh, wasn't that what Mike Lindell was doing? Well, Mike Lindell. So, and this is what's interesting is that the GBI does not note that because the, the Washington Post first reported this kind of odd 
coincidence of, or maybe not coincidence, of Mike Lindell, his private jet landing in Douglas, Georgia, uh, for two hours the night Misty is, resigns. And, and he told them that he was meeting with pillow entrepreneurs about uh, prototypes for cooling pillow samples or, or cooling towels. Yeah, I believe that's just it was. what one does. You make an, right. a, during the flight, you make an unscheduled stop to talk to pillow entrepreneurs in rural counties not known for pillow production, right? <laughs> right. So, I mean, surely that's what we do. But the odd thing is, and the GBI report does not mention what Lindell told the Washington Post, which was, you know, an, an article that kind of is how the Coffee County breach really became uh, publicly known from that article. So I, surely they have read it. The GBI report does mention that it interviewed Eddie Cheney. Uh, I also interviewed Eddie Cheney after we received the report. Um, according to Cheney, who is a part-time air, uh, airport employee, uh, who you know saw Mike Lindell come in uh, that evening? He said that at the time Mike Lindell said that he was there to uh, attend an event at Atkinson County High School. Atkinson County High School is one of the local uh, high schools in the area. It's it's where Misty you know is alum an alumni of that school, and and I understand that at the time her, her children uh, or one of her children was attending that school. I don't know if that is, again, another coincidence or not, but uh, regardless, there's just some, and, and there's some other but things when, in when, the piece people can read about. But... To, you reached out to mm -hmm. Mike Lindell. Uh, yes. And what did he tell you he was doing there? So he is, Mike Lindell insisted when I spoke to him that he was there to meet with uh, my pillow product vendors, or he said he was probably there to meet with product vendors. Uh, he, he said that, however, when I asked him about this, you know, explanation that Eddie Cheney gave about Atkinson County High School, uh, Mike Lindell told me that, you know, he has given speeches at high schools in the past. He, he doesn't recall that one, but, you know, he, he wanted possible. to, <laughs> but it's possible. Yeah, just uh, an unscheduled stop to do an event at a high school and meet with pillow entrepreneurs or product vendors. Right, and he he also told me that he uh, would not give me the contact information for the so-called vendors um, uh, because he said that you know media attention has kind of it, it caused him to lose business and and fractured some of the relationships that he has with with those vendors. Uh, and then he also told me that he does not know Misty Hampton and that uh, when I asked him, well, then why, you know, what was the deal with her? She, at the, the night that he arrived, she had the MyPillow website in her browser, according to some text messages that we reviewed. And he said, well, maybe she likes MyPillow. I think that seems very likely. Um, all right, so I know what every listener is thinking, having been bombarded with this um, uh, barrage of information, which is, is Anna Bauer a crazy person who like puts push pins in her walls and makes connections between things with string between the push pins? So, um, uh, first of all, are you nuts? And secondly, um, if not, why is this important? It's pretty far, it's, it, we're pretty far down a rabbit hole here. Bring us up to the top of the hill. Why, why should people care if the investigation by the GBI of the Coffee County angle of the Fulton County indictment uh, is or is not adequate. Right. Okay. So let's start with the, am I a conspiracy theorist? I, I will admit that there are parts of reporting on and writing about this story that kind of have made me feel like one occasionally. <laughs> Uh, because I do feel a little bit like that meme of the guy with like all the, the bulletin board and the, all the red like strings kind of connecting the dots. 
Um, but I, I mean, I, I can you be a conspiracy theorist if the conspiracy has already been alleged by I, I mean, it's there there is an alleged conspiracy that is that is in the Fulton County indictment. Uh, right. So it literally <laughs> alleges a conspiracy. It literally alleges a conspiracy. <laughs> And and I think that it is important for uh, you know people to know whether or not uh, their law enforcement agencies are thoroughly and completely investigating something that is or or as alleged in the Fulton County indictment constitutes a, a very serious crime. Uh, it alleges that there was a conspiracy between local officials and and loyalists to the then president of the United States and his legal team who then conspired to unlawfully take and distribute voting system data. And there are many uh, election security experts who say that the consequences of the Coffee County breach could be something that you know increases the risk of of threats to future elections. Uh, they point to things like uh, the ability to manipulate um, uh, legitimate data to create disinformation campaigns. Uh, they also point to some of the security issues in, in that anyone who has access to this software um, effectively, you know, can. Uh, search for vulnerabilities or or ways to attack it with with malware at future elections. Um, so you know there it's a serious crime. There are potentially serious consequences. Uh, and the Fulton County case, that investigation has always been something that has been jurisdictionally limited. Um, Fulton County, of course, is usually bound to the jurisdictional limits of Fulton County itself because the district attorney was able to uh, uh, kind of craft a RICO indictment that did allow her to expand beyond the, the usual jurisdictional limits of Fulton County. But it, it's very clear from that indictment that she is still trying to tie uh, the events in Coffee County very closely to Fulton County by, for example, uh, uh, writing that Sullivan Strickler, the forensics team, is a is a company that is um, incorporated or or based in in Fulton County. Um, and and then of course there's just resource resource concerns. You know, Fonnie Willis as a county level district attorney has has more limited resources than the GBI or federal law enforcement. Um, so, so, so it was concern, important. Your concern basically is that that nobody except the GBI and maybe Jack Smith, the special counsel, though there's no evidence that he's been interested in this subject at all. Nobody really has an interest in investigating the whole conspiracy except right. the GBI, and they didn't do it. Right. That's exactly what it is. It, that, In other words, you know, kind of like the old Yiddish expression, even paranoids have enemies, which is sometimes translated as, you know, if they're really out to get you, it's not paranoid. The paranoia is just good thinking, right? You're saying if there really is a conspiracy, conspiracy theorizing is actually perfectly reasonable. Right. Conspiracy theorizing is perfectly reasonable. Although I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm theorizing. I, I I'm not making, evidence. right. I, and it's I'm not reporting. making, right. It's called reporting. And, and I'm not making any, you know, grand conclusions about, you know, who exactly did what, or who's the mastermind or that kind of thing. I, I mean, I'm just pointing out that there is a lot of publicly available information or information that is just easily findable uh, that, that a it reasonable seems... investigator yeah. would want to have taken. So I just want to say, as the editor of this story, uh, the person who actually had to uh, figure out whether the dots on the wall really connect, they actually all do. Um, and I'm, of course, teasing you about it. But um, I would not have published it if I didn't think the um, uh, the 
the points are extremely cogent and some of them take a little bit of uh, intimacy with the evidence in order to uh, understand, which is why the piece is as long as it is. Um, but yeah, you do come away from it with a sense that this investigation was quite deficient and that there's a lot more to this story. I'm not sure you've created much like a high, that much hypothesis about what the missing pieces are, but that there are missing pieces is very, very clear. Right. All right, so what happens now? The GBI has done its report. It's, uh, it's in the hands of the attorney general. Uh, should we be looking for uh, action by Chris Carr? Is there ongoing investigative activity? What happens now? It's really unclear. Uh, all that is publicly known is that Chris Carr has the report and that he is in the process of reviewing it. Uh, and he has his office has said that he, they continue to coordinate with the GBI. So it is uh, very unclear at this point, uh, you know, when decisions might be made or, or what decisions he he could make in terms of uh, a, a continuing investigation or or seeking uh, potential indictments. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that. Um, you know, it, it may be the case that uh, the attorney general's office lets the Fulton County case run its course. Um, and um, I, I am not entirely convinced that there will be any more that comes of it. On that note, we will leave it there, leave the listener in suspense and uh, 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 check back. Uh, the next time somebody dumps 400 pages that don't say very much in your lap. Anna Bauer, uh, the story is what the GBI missed in Coffee County. At almost 400 pages, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation report on the Coffee County caper looks impressive. It's not. Uh, Anna Bauer, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me.